right, Jeremy Veldman, welcome to another episode of Telescope Tips. And I'm joined once again by Keith Latule, and we're talking all things astrophotography. Now, in our last episode, we talked about the William Optics Refractor Telescope that Keith uses for astrophotography, which is a good option for you guys when you're getting started. Today, we got another telescope that Keith uses, and this is a Schmidt Cassegrain type design. So, Keith, why don't you talk about what we got here today? Sure. Um, you guys may have seen this for, as far as it goes for kind of the biggest aperture, and maybe the biggest bang for the buck, a uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, you, you just can't go wrong with it. Um, what it does is it actually, and I'll show you the light path, the light path comes in through the collector, comes all the way back here and hits the primary mirror. It is sent up to the secondary mirror, which is located about right here, and then after bouncing off the secondary mirror, comes all the way back down out through the eyepiece, which is where you look. The uh, advantage of that is, again, it's an eight inch aperture and it's got about a 2,000 millimeter focal length, okay? So, great magnification. It's a terrific scope. It does a nice job. Again, the price is right. One of the drawbacks for astrophotography is this shoots at about an F10. Remember we talked about the F ratios and how if you get down an F ratio, you, the further down you can bring it, the better off because it's going to be a faster scope. So an F, a fast focal uh, ratio would be something like about an F4, F5, somewhere in that range? Yeah, and even better than that would be terrific. I mean, F2. again, it's that... that elusive goal that you'd love to go you know and um, and some of the Newtons are really good for the price you can really get a, a, a good scope with a, an f2 f3 wow. on a Newton so um, don't please don't overlook those um, I have a daub in the other room but it's not a imaging daub but yeah my daub is an f4 just for, for reference yep. and this is an f10 right um, one of the things that one of the really smart uh, kind of uh, astrophotography people have come up with is something up here. It's called a hyperstar system. And what this does is a hyperstar system removes that secondary mirror and replaces that secondary mirror with some more optics. Now, what it does now, instead of um, the light coming out of the, the, the back where you, you put in a, an eyepiece, what happens is the light is going to come in through the collection mirror. It's going to through the collection frame. It's going to come back to the mirror, primary mirror, and then it's going to go back out up. Instead, this time it's not hitting the secondary mirror because the secondary mirror is not there. It's going straight into the CCD camera. Now, this particular model, when you've got it set up as a hyperstar, you can't do visual. So it is only astrophotography in this particular setup. But so what's the big deal? What does that do for it? It takes this scope that was an F10 and now reduces it all the way down to an F2. Wow. So really does uh, a nice job of making the scope really fast. Again, you still have a pretty decent size aperture on this particular one. It's still going to be 8 inch. Does not interfere with any of the light collection at all, even though the camera is right on this. And you can see on this particular one, the hyperstar is here. The camera is no bigger than the hyperstar. Um, you'll have a couple of wires coming off of this. Uh, you might see them as diffraction spikes in some of the stars, but chances are you, you, you probably won't. But does a great job of taking a scope like this and making it really fast. Now, the advantage of that, and, and I'm a big I know we can get in an argument about this, but I'm a big proponent of one-shot color cameras. Uh, I know, I know that they do the Bayer process and it really takes a, you know, the difference between a monochrome camera and a color camera is you're going to get less with the, the color camera because it's actually taking some of those pixels to colorize it. Here's my problem. I don't have two days to stay out. I can't stay up all night long, and so I don't want to take, you know, 20 shots of green, 20 shots of blue, 20 shots of red, and combine them together with illuminance. I want to do one shot and do it quick. Yep. The great thing about it with the Hyperstar is I can actually come out, and again, with an F2 scope, I can do 30, 60 minute subs, and do that, get about 20, 30 subs, do some darks, bias, flats, 
and I'm done. I'm back in the house for midnight or earlier, and um, I'm, I'm at work the next day. So yeah, that's the advantage again of a fast focal length telescope, fast focal ratio telescope. The faster the telescope, the, the shorter the duration in terms of the, the exposure time to, to get those images, yep. and you can get the color also. Absolutely. Now, some of the things you're going to have to think about too, and, and if you're anything like me, I live in a wonderful neighborhood where, um, I don't know if you can look around right now, but everybody has a street light. Yep. and light pollution everybody wants to turn on the outside porch lights yeah. and and quite frankly it's it's daytime out here <laughs> um, there, you might also hear right behind us is a baseball field and they have lights so they may turn them on at night yep. so one of the things you really need to kind of look at again we're, we're all suffer from light pollution unless we kind of go out to the middle of the United States somewhere in the desert um, maybe look at some filters there are a number of filters that you can get i'm still kind of experimenting with some of the filters um i've got this this is a, a sky glow broadband filter for two inch and um it won't fit on this particular one but in my other models it'll certainly work on i do have a filter on this one and it's situated inside the hyperstar um, there's also narrow band filters and the difference between the two is broadband and narrow band when you're talking about broadband, you're looking at all the light spectrum, all the way across. So you want to, with broadband, you're trying to filter across all of it. Narrowband, what narrowband does is it only gives you a small band. In other words, it filters everything, everything else. else exactly and gives you that small band now sometimes you may want to be able to shoot just that small narrow band combine it with some other pictures and get a little more detail one of the other things that you may want to look at too is an h alpha filter yeah um they're pricey they're they're expensive um but it does a great job of just picking up that that those hydrogen little molecules that you can find out there. This particular one is, is pretty small and it goes with the DSLR camera. Um, I don't have one for this camera yet. Well, again, um, a hydrogen alpha filter is great for nebula absolutely. or emission nebula because you're getting the, uh, the hydrogen lines and that's what it's singling that out against the background. So you see more contrast, you can actually see the nebulosity in more detail. And really, it's, it's a critical filter for you to have for astro astrophotography. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, you know, any of these filters, um, we can talk about them. Uh, <laughs> some of them will uh, cut out different different forms of street lights. Uh, and so you kind of got to get a sense of where you are, what your street lights are, to, to know exactly which filter to go to. So, um, but does a great job. I would strongly suggest some type of filter or playing around with it. Now, if you had to go with one filter, you got a comp, you got a you got a collection here, but if you're getting started in an urban area where there is some light pollution, you had to pick one. Which which one would you be your starter filter, your go-to filter? I think it's this one. It's uh, from Orion, and it's the Skyglow imaging filter, and it goes across the entire band. Um, this one is a two inch, and I think it was about 150, 160 bucks. Uh, inch and a inch and a quarter probably cost you a lot less than that. Um, it does a great job of kind of getting rid of some of those street lights. Yeah, again, Sky Glow for uh, filtering out or reducing the light pollution for more contrast, yep. correct? Yep. Right. Absolutely. And then I would imagine a hydrogen alpha would be maybe your second or third choice. If it you're would. Nebulosity. Absolutely. Yeah. And and again, um, what I usually do with the hydrogen alpha is I'll go ahead and take regular shots, maybe with the Sky Go Sky Glow, and then I'll put the hydrogen alpha filter in there, and in the processing, I'll add it in as a different layer, and it really picks up some of the detail. Yeah. And then you just put the layers together when Absolutely. you do your post processing, and that's where you get these really cool images. Yep. So, yeah, very good. Well, again, thanks, Keith. Very informative. Yeah. Guys, again, I want to remind you, the Memphis Astronomical Society meets once a month, first Friday of every month at Christian Brothers University, Assessi Hall, room 155. Meetings start at 8 o'clock p.m. And we conduct two dark sky observing sessions, if it's clear, at a dark sky location about 45 minutes from Memphis in northwest Mississippi. And if you'd like to learn more about how you can get involved, our website is memphisastro.org. And subscribe to this YouTube channel also youtube.com slash Memphis Astron Society. For Keith Latule, I'm Jeremy Veldman. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you guys on our next episode.
Thank you.